we've been around some guys. If you know of some people back in the States, you know, Roy DeMeo and, of course, Grace Scarpa and Tommy Patera, the guys that they talk about all the time, you know, pretty rough guys. But they have nothing on these Cray twins. I'll tell you that. These men were wild. And some of the things that they got involved in and some of the things that they did, just crazy. And we're going to get into that a little bit. sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody's doing well. All is very good, very blessed on this end. And of course, I always give God all the praise, honor, and glory for that. As you can see, I'm still in my London studio, my hotel room. Uh, we're going to be heading up to Glasgow soon. Excited about that. So we've been all over and it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, I have to say that, you know, and this is a beautiful city. I can tell you, the mix of the old, beautiful buildings, um, dynamic buildings, and the new architecture, they blended it in so well, so perfectly. It's just a great city, twice the size of New York. So that's how big it is. It's really great. Restaurants, there must be five on every street. It's on, on every block, I should say. And of course, a pub, two, three, four on every corner. People just love having fun here. They enjoy it. They love their beer. They love their tea. They love their wine. And they'll be getting some of ours, Francis Wine. And again, we're now available in 41 states. So we're excited about that. And sales have been going extremely well. So that's the update on that. And, um, you know, interestingly enough, uh, last time I was here, I went to a little city called in London called Shortage. And there was a hotel there called the Courthouse Hotel. We stayed in that hotel. It was uh, at one time a courthouse. And a lot of notorious uh, criminals went through that courthouse. And a couple of them were the uh, Cray Twins. And they actually have a cell. Well, it's not a cell anymore, but it used to be the cell that Ronnie and Reggie were both in and a couple other guys. And I think you'll see some video footage of that. We visited there a couple of days ago. It was great. And uh, so I, I thought it would be interesting since I'm in the United Kingdom, spending so much time in London, that we do something on the Cray Twins. And I got to tell you, you know, there's no mafia here in the United Kingdom. There's no mafia in London, but they do have their share of, of gangsters. And of course, Peaky Blinders, I've spoken about that. I love that series. They're out of Birmingham, but of course, they spent some time in London also. Then we have the Cray Twins. And I got to tell you, we've been around some guys. If you know of some people back in the States, you know, Roy DeMeo and of course, Grace Scarpa and Tommy Patera, the guys that they talk about all the time. You know, pretty rough guys, but they have nothing on these Cray twins. I'll tell you that. These men were wild. And some of the things that they got involved in and some of the things that they did, just crazy. And we're going to get into that a little bit. I didn't study their entire history, but being at the courthouse, people spoke to me about them. I've heard some things about them while I'm here. During my events, people would ask me about the craze. If we ever had any involvement with them, I certainly didn't. You know, they went to jail at the end of the 60s, I believe, and I wasn't even involved in a life at that point in time. So, And I know in the movie The Legend, it showed that there was some involvement, possibly. My friend Chas Palminteri was in that. Uh, I never verified it, didn't ask, don't know if that's true or not. I know if it was to any large degree, I certainly would have heard about it during my time. So I don't think if there was any involvement, it wasn't anything too dramatic or too, uh, you know, important, I would say. Let's get into them a little bit because they really are two interesting guys. Twins, identical twins. They were born in October 1933. They're 10 minutes apart, I believe. Reggie uh, was the oldest. Then came Ronnie 10 minutes later. It's amazing how identical twins come out like that within a few minutes. And uh, their dad was an Irishman. Tough Irishman from what I understand, and their mom was uh, from Romania, a Romani. I, I often wonder, you know, Sammy once made a remark, I wondered if it applied to the Cray twins because, Sammy Gravano, because he lived, uh, you know, his mom and dad were two nice people. They tried to raise him the right way, brought him up the right way. And Sammy once made a statement that his parents just considered him a bad seed, a bad kid. I didn't see anything in the craze background when they were growing up, you know, to lead me to believe that they had a rough childhood. I don't know. It doesn't go into that too much. But obviously there was something wrong with them. 
no doubt. And later on in life, I believe Ronnie was uh, d diagnosed as uh, schizophrenic. He ended his days in a mental institution. So if it, it was probably something breeding in him for quite some time. I know in the movie Legend, it shows that he was a bit off balance. I don't know if it was true his whole life like that, but he did end up and actually died in a uh, mental institution. I think it was Broadmoor Hospital, something like that, uh, in and around uh, London. What goes on in people that just something happens in them, something clicks, they're just not right. I don't know. I can't answer that. I'm not sure. I know if you grow up in a, in a rough house, in a, in a rough upbringing that, uh, you know, where you saw a lot of turbulence, maybe a lot of violence throughout your childhood years, it certainly impacts you and you could end up the same way. Uh, of course, we are products of our environment in many, many ways, but uh, these two y young men uh, turned into uh, <laughs> some pretty rough guys. And so let me get started. When they were kids, they got into amateur boxing and they were both doing quite well. They were very competitive with one another and uh, they were doing well. They might have had a future, you know, as professional boxers. Uh, however, uh, they got drafted into the army. And when they got drafted, it was uh, it was crazy from the beginning. It was obvious that they couldn't take discipline and authority. I mean, they were beating up on some of their uh, commanding officers. Uh, they left, you know, without, uh, you know, asking for leave. They went AWOL. They got arrested for that later on. They were court-martialed for certain things that they did. Uh, they were convicted in the court-martial uh, process and then sent to the military prison. You know, one of the interesting things, they were among the last inmates that were housed in the Tower of London. And the Tower of London has an amazing history. You should go back and look at it. I'm not going to, uh, you know, divert and get into that right now. But uh, in World War One and World War Two, the Tower of London was used as a prison for, you know, some hardcore uh, inmates. And they were among the last that were housed in the Tower of London. They go through the court martial, they get convicted, they're in, uh, in jail, in the military jail. While they were in the military jail, they, uh, they threw tantrums all the time. And when I say they, it was the both of them. Remember, they're twins, and it's amazing how a lot of their personality is identical, like their appearance. They do the same things. They're protective of one another. It's a crazy dynamic, but, you know, it's understandable. I'm not going to get into the biology and the genetics of that. But they, they threw tantrums. They emptied a latrine bucket over an officer's head. They dumped a canteen of hot tea on another officer. They handcuffed a guard to uh, the prison bars with stolen handcuffs. And they set their bedding on fire. So they didn't know what to do with these two guys. So they released them from the military prison, and they put them in a normal prison. And they spent the rest of the time, whatever their sentence was, in a normal prison. Then when they get out, outside of the uh, uh, military compound, then they went, when they get out through a series of circumstances or whatever, their boxing careers were over because they had these convictions. They couldn't compete anymore. So they go into a nightclub business. And uh, they owned a club called the Esmeralda Barn, which was located now where the Berkeley Hotel is in London. I understand it was a great uh, club during that time. And owning that club uh, made them celebrities. You know, it's amazing how people, celebrities, want to hang out with mob guys. Now, I experienced that. You people know that because we've talked about it in the past. But a lot of people, a lot of American actors and actresses that visited London went to this club. And they knew who owned it. They went to this club. And they enjoyed hanging out with uh, the Cray Twins. Who? George Raft. Now we know George Raft. Who was he close with? Bugsy Siegel. So obviously he had an attraction. He played a tough guy in films. He had an attraction to these type of guys and uh, he hung out there. Frank Sinatra, from what I understand, he frequented that club whenever he was in London. You know, and there's a little bit more with Sinatra with these two Cray twins later on. So you know, don't think that they're scared off by mob guys. Not everybody. You know, a lot of them like to be around. And I understand the store club in Manhattan when um, uh, Frank Costello owned it. Mob guys would hang out there all the time, including my dad. Marilyn Monroe and some of the top stars of their time would come into that club all the time. And they knew who owned it. But they liked to rub shoulders. There was something about it. You know, mob guys don't always scare everybody away. Peter Sellers, English actor, great. He used to go to the club. He hung out with the Cray brothers. Judy Garland, imagine that. Judy Garland, Wizard of Oz, she hung out there. Sammy Davis Jr., another one who visited the club quite a bit. Liza Benelli, again, followed in her mom's footsteps. She went there whenever she was in London. And Jane Mansfield, you know, the sex symbol of the time, she hung out there too. So they had a lot of celebrities as well as politicians coming into that club. You know, they were very charismatic and uh, people were attracted to them. There's no doubt about it.
Then something crazy happened in 1964. The Sunday Mirror, which is a big, big column in uh, London at the time, wrote a, uh, a story about Ronnie having a homosexual relationship with Lord Boothby. He was a conservative politician at that time. And at that time, sex between men was a criminal act uh, here in the United Kingdom. You couldn't do it. So it was a crazy story. You know, later on, actually, Ronnie did admit that he was bisexual. He did admit that, and we saw that in the movie The Legend. But that story, you know, went all over, and it caused a big stir. Now, after it happened, uh, both Ronnie and Reggie, from what I understand, they threatened the reporter that wrote the story. And Lord Booth, who was, you know, just outraged over this, he actually sued the Sunday Mirror. And there was a lot of, a lot of media around this. He eventually won the lawsuit. I think he won 40,000 pounds in a settlement against uh, the newspaper. So that was probably the best thing that happened to the craze at the time, because when that happened, they became pretty much untouchable. The law enforcement didn't really want to go after them. The newspapers and the media stopped writing anything negative about them. And for a while, they had a free time doing their thing. Now, understand, you know, allegedly they were involved in murder and extortion and armed robbery and things like that. So uh, allegedly they were committing these things all the time. So they were criminals. They were gangsters in that regard. And they actually had their own gang. It was called The Firm. So they had a lot of guys around them, too. But this uh, incident actually helped them because it took the heat off for quite some time. Now, they kept getting investigated, you know, and law enforcement was trying to do their job, but nobody would ever testify against them because their reputation, not only their reputation, but the reputation of the gang, the firm. They could never get anything on them, could never pin anything on them. And then they, they uh, shot and killed rival gang members, one being a guy by the name of George Cornell, would later come back to haunt them. Uh, Ronnie killed him because uh, George allegedly called him a fat poof. A fat poof, which is derogatory for a gay man. And that was the only reason he called, he shot him, from what I understood. Uh, so again, Ronnie was, was kind of wild. Uh, they helped Frank Mitchell, who, had, who was called the Mad Axe Man, uh, escape from Dartmoor Prison. But he was crazy, and the later had to kill him. So I don't know why they helped him escape. They thought it was going to help him in some way, or he was going to be part of the gang, I'm not sure. But he was a madman. He was hard to control. The Mad Axe Man. I guess he got his name for a reason. And uh, they later murdered him. They were actually tried for that murder, but they were acquitted on that also. Then it was reported that they killed a guy by the name of Jack the Hat McVite. I think it's McVite or McVitie. I'm not sure how they say it here. But he was a member of their own gang. And for some reason, they lured him into the basement. They had a problem with him. And uh, I believe it was um, uh, Reggie. They went to shoot him in the head, actually fired at him, but the gun misfired. And when that misfired, McVet, McVitie, whatever his name was, who was a pretty tough guy, there was a big struggle. Somebody handed Reggie a knife. Um, I think he initially cut him with a piece of glass. He might have broken a glass and cut him. Then somebody handed him a knife. Very gruesomely, he carved this guy up. At least that's what was reported. This was another, another um, step in their downfall because they tried to dispose of the body. They gave it to two other gang guys, from what I understand, to dispose of the body. Somehow that didn't work, and the craze had to go themselves. The body was left in a car. It wasn't disposed of properly. So the craze had to go themselves and dispose of it, and I understand they wrapped him up in chicken wire or something, and then they threw him, they threw him in the uh, English Channel. That's what it was reported. Now, this was a bad incident because a lot of people within the gang and a lot of people around were starting to get disgusted with them. I guess the behavior got really erratic. A lot of people within the gang believed that uh, this Jack McVitie should not have been murdered. And people now were starting to get annoyed and informants were starting to brew. And this is what happens, you know. People get disenchanted, they get upset, they felt that things were not going right, that they were not acting properly, maybe they would be the next in line, you killed one of your own gang members, you know, and people started to get uh, nervous about this, and now law enforcement started to really put the pressure on these two. Eventually, Detective Leonard Nipper, that was his nickname, of Scotland Yard, brought the twins down for a series of crimes, including murder, and he was hot on their tail. He was able to start turning some informants. It was a rough process because it wasn't easy. But, you know, they put the pressure on. They had to get rid of these guys. Look, when you make yourself that kind of a reputation, eventually you're going to go down. I mean, we've seen it all the time with Gotti and everybody that was out there and kept rubbing their nose in the government's face, whether they intended to do that or not. It was certainly perceived that that happens. 
the craze were really out of control. When you start to think that you're, uh, you know, bulletproof, that nobody can get a hold of you, that's when things start to tumble. Remember, pride comes before the fall. So the heat was now really on them. Guys are starting to flip. Informants are starting to come forward. You know, law enforcement, Scotland Yard is working hard on these guys. And eventually they bring charges against them. They convict them. And both of them get life in prison. And they had a minimum of 30 years before they can even go up for parole. So... Uh, this was a death sentence, basically, to both of them. Now, they separated him. They didn't keep him in the same prison. And uh, Ronnie Cray eventually um, was diagnosed as being certifi certifiably insane. And he went to uh, Broadmoor, where he eventually died. It was either in Broadmoor or another hospital. But uh, we saw in the movie Legend that he was never really in his right mind. And you wonder, you know, how did that happen? Something in his childhood? Did he develop? Was he always this way? Who knows? You know, the interesting thing here, too, is that while they were in prison, Reggie, who was the smarter of the two, I think, he was certainly a little bit more balanced, even in his uh, craziness. He was a little more balanced than Ronnie. They were running a uh, guard service, uh, a protective guard service. And Frank Sinatra actually hired them. He had, I think, 18 of their bodyguards when he went and visited Wil Wimbledon in 1985. And uh, whether or not Sinatra knew that this was Cray's place or not, I would imagine he did because, you know, the, uh, you know, the guards, the bodyguards, they talk. Uh, but Sinatra, I'm not saying he did anything wrong. I mean, he hired a guard service and he had... Uh, bodyguards protecting him. There's nothing wrong with that. But they were doing this from inside prison, and eventually prison officials found out. Uh, they separated Ronnie and uh, Reggie. And uh, Ronnie died, I believe, in 1995. He had a heart attack in the hospital. Reggie was released from prison on a compassionate release in October of 2000, and he died a few weeks later. He had terminal bladder cancer. And uh, it's interesting that the brothers were buried alongside of each other, and on their tombstone, you have both of their pictures, so they're in one gravesite. Uh, sad, but uh, that's how it ended up for both of them. And, you know, there was actually uh, some documentaries and movies made, obviously the movie Legend. Tom Hardy played brilliantly. He played both twins, and he was, uh, he was amazing, brilliant in that role. It was a great movie. I reviewed it at one point on a Mob Movie Monday. And uh, there was also an earlier movie called The Craze. Haven't seen that, but uh, heard it was a good film. And then there was a documentary. It was called The Gangster and the Pervert Peer. So the gangster, obviously, was Ronnie Cray, and the pervert peer, I guess, was that Lord Booth. So uh, they had some things written about him. There's a couple of books. I think Reggie wrote a book, didn't read it, but uh, I understand he poured his heart out in that book. You know, he was married a couple of times. One of his wives committed suicide, I think, three years after they were married. In the movie The Legend, it said she committed suicide because she loved Reggie. She knew he would never turn from his ways and just couldn't handle it. She couldn't deal with it. So she committed suicide. I don't know if that was the, uh, you know, real cause of it or not. Who knows? But that's what it said in the movie. Uh, so really, that's it, you know. And uh, here's something very, very interesting. Reggie Cray uh, became a born-again Christian while in prison. And some of you are going to say, oh, there we go. You know, here we go again. Here's a guy who's a murderer. He did all these bad things. And all of a sudden, he turns to God and everything is forgiven. Listen. I'm not here to judge him. I don't know if it was sincere or not. This is what's what was reported. He became a born-again Christian. Why do I believe that? Well, I turned to God while I was in prison, and my life has been on a much better path since that time. I don't think he had an opportunity to turn it around because after he was released, he died within six weeks. Who knows? I wasn't there in the last moments of his death either. But if he did confess his sins sincerely, and he did accept Jesus Christ as a Christian. We believe sins are forgiven. Oh, come on, Mike. How can you do that? Well, thief on the cross, last few seconds of his life, he saw something in our Lord Jesus. He asked for forgiveness. And what did Jesus say to him? Today, you will be with me in paradise. We have that to hang on to. Of course, we have all of Scripture and all of the examples and all of the people. So that's what we believe. And, you know, for those of you that, you know, want to knock him for it, I got to tell you this. A few years back, I visited Angola Prison in Louisiana. It was once called the Alcatraz of the South, and it was called America's Bloodiest Prison. I went and visited there to speak to the inmates. And um, Billy Graham had gone there several times, from what I understand, to speak to the inmates. There was actually a plaque 
or I don't remember a sculpture of him being there because he devoted so much time for these inmates. Most of the inmates are there are doing life. All violent crimes, all toughest of criminals doing life. The men that I spoke to, and there were several of them, had a calm about them, a peaceful presence about them that was, it was hard to explain. They're never getting out of prison. They're in one of the most toughest prisons in the country, but there was something about them. They had a peace and you felt it. You really felt it. So, you know, when you come to Christ or you really are born again, something does come over you. I can say that. Now, again, I'm not perfect. I'm not saying I, I'm not a sinner and I'm never going to sin. You know, as Christians, we're better. And when we do sin, we're sorry for it. And we ask for forgiveness. That's the sign of a Christian. It's not perfection. The Bible is very clear on that. If he was a born-again Christian, hey, more power to him than... He's probably sitting up in paradise right now. Hard for some of you to believe, and some of you are going to get upset and all this kind of stuff, and I know I'll get comments. But I'm sorry. That's my faith. That's what I believe, and I stand up for it, and that's it. And I invite all of you, all of you who might be struggling, rather than knock it, take a look, really. You know, do your own research. Do your investigation. Read the Bible like I did. You know, read other faiths. Read other religions. Do all you need to do. And then come to your own conclusion. We have a free will. God doesn't impose anything on us. We have a free will. So if he did become a Christian, hey, more power to him. God bless him. And uh, the end result for him will be okay. So that's really it for today. Very, very interesting. Hope you enjoy the video that we showed of um, uh, the Courthouse Hotel now. Listen, every country has their gangsters. They may not have the mafia, but they have their gangsters. And the Cray Twins, they're up there with everybody else, that's for sure. Nobody uh, has much on the two of them. So that's it for today. Life for me in uh, London and the UK will continue for quite some time. All of you who have subscribed, thank you very much. We appreciate you enjoying the content. We're on a march now to a million. We're, uh, we're doing pretty well. When we hit a million, we are going to have a huge giveaway. A lot of people are going to benefit over it because we want to show our appreciation. That's it. Thank you all for that. Franzies Wine, look into it, franzieswine.com. Uh, soon it will be all over the world. Love all of you guys. How do I leave you? Same way. Be safe. Be healthy. God bless all of you. And I sincerely mean that. And yes, I'll see you next time from the UK. Take care.